Welcome to Funkatopia Live. And today we have a very, very special interview with the one and only Hans Martin Buff, widely recognized recording studio engineer, worked as an assistant engineer between 1993 and 1996 at Pachyderm. That's where Nirvana's In Utero was uh, recorded too, if I remember correctly, and also Paisley Park. And then in 1996 to 2000, you became Prince's personal engineer. So there's quite a lot to talk about. Welcome, Hans Martin Buff. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So you're located in, in Germany right now, right? Yes, I am. I'm from Germany, um, and I moved to the States in the 90s, and I went back, but I live uh, in a beautiful I live in a beautiful place. I pretty much live where uh, Sound of Music happened, so it's about 40 miles down the road. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, I but I move around, you know. It's like that's what happened when I moved back from the states. I realized whenever I work, I work somewhere else, so it doesn't matter where I live because I'm going away anyways. So this is a this was an inspired choice. Yeah, so for those who don't know, we had to pre-record this interview. It is actually like nine o'clock in the morning here in Atlanta. And what time is it there in in Germany? It's three in the afternoon. Okay, so there you have it. So, and before we start, and I hope this is not, you know, too personal or weird, but what is the history of your name? I, I for some reason, I, I can't recall anyone who has a hyphenated first name like that. I mean, last names and surnames for sure, but not for, what's the history behind your name? Actually, that's, uh, that's quite common around here. In this is it really? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's quite common in, uh, in France. They do like Jean Philippe or, oh, that's true. Yeah. or, you know. Gotcha. Something like Kelly Joe in in the states, or something <laughs> like that. And, and I unfortunately was born in a time when that was really hip in Germany. So you can, it's it's not that common anymore. But it was then. It's always Hans, whatever. Is and, that your grandfather's name or father's name or? Oh, no, it was really. They just thought, oh, that's a cool way of putting names together. So here I am. Could have been worse. <laughs> There's worse second names. <laughs> but the the odd thing is, you know, Americans call me Hans, which is fine. But uh, when I was a kid, they called me Martin. So the the pre hyphen thing is just kind of a lead in. So Martin is really the name that my parents used, and then things changed rapidly. British people call me Buff. That's probably the easiest. So there you have it. And then I saw I've seen H M Buff too. I've seen that. Yeah. It's very very literary sounding. <laughs> With majesty, heavy metal, whatever you want to do, it all works. So, and it fit oh. on the on those huge credit lists at the Paisley Park. So I bet. Yeah. Yeah. He was always a, a big fan of trying to make it as short as possible. Yeah. <laughs> so to get started as a studio engineer, what is your background and how did you get started doing that out of the gate? Well, the, the fun thing is I never thought about myself as a technical person and uh, people who know me well and have known me for a long time. were still amused by the fact that I went into something that's tech, uh, tech based in a way at least, or, you know, uses technology to be creative. I was always into uh, language and uh, storytelling and all that stuff. So I was uh, actually a journalist in the beginning. I, that was my first plan after high school and worked really well. I was in radio in Germany for a minute, and then I got bored. The big moment that lots of people have, you know, when plan one just tanks. <laughs> right. What were you doing as a, as, were you a DJ or what were you doing in the radio? Uh, you know, like public radio type stuff where, you know, doing, right. doing stories, doing, um, doing emceeing in a weird way, but like doing DJing as well. It was like one of the European um, radio stations are much more one size fits all than, than, uh, than American ones. You know, it's like, it's really, that was one of the things I learned when I moved to the States that people could, you know, listen to the radio Right. all their lives from morning to night and not know who, you know, Jay-Z is or, or you know, from the other end, who who the who ACDC is or whatever. Whereas here, radio stations are much more mishmash. So, you you know, that like a lot of it is mainstream. So you have like the current top 10 stuff, but you also hear like an old smoky tune and then there's a Prince tune and then there's Highway to Hell. And it certainly helps that people don't know the language very well. So you have also yeah. hits like, Bobby Brown by Frank Zappa, which would never play on any radio station in the States. Uh, <laughs> you know, the fest. Well, and I learned that. So there, so that's what I did in radio. I just, uh, 
Yeah, and I learned that when I, uh, many years ago, when I interviewed Thomas Dolby, and he was telling me about, because I, I one of the questions I asked Thomas, I said, you know, you keep referring to Caroline, and who is this Caroline? And he goes, oh, it's a, it's a radio station. I was like, oh, I was not aware of that. And it's like, yeah, it was a radio station that got broadcast from a ship in the, in the middle of, it was pretty much pirate radio. And uh, Caroline was a station that was often to like, a, I guess, out in the ocean or lake or wherever it was. And uh, they would broadcast from there. It's pirate radio. I guess there was a whole entire movie made about it, but I, I did not know that's what he was referring to with Caroline. But yeah, it was just interesting to hear some of the things that uh, it's very, very different in European radio, for sure. Um, For those that don't, or may not necessarily know what is the job of a producer in the studio. I mean, it's not just recording. I mean, because a lot of times there's actually a lot of hand holding involved, right? But you know, what what are some of the things that are differences between an engineer and a, and a, and a producer? Just for clarification. Well, a lot of people get confused because uh, a producer in movies is the guy who brings in the money. Um, so they figure, ah, oh, that's what the producer does. Right in music too. And a lot of people give themselves production credit because they put five year, five bucks on the table or something, but um, that's a different story. Anyway, to yeah. explain it properly in movie terms, that's actually the way, the best way to understand it. I think um, a producer in music is kind of like the director in movies. So that, that can be all kinds of things, but it's generally the big thing is the producer in is, is the guy who's calling the shots. So you're the guy, you're the person who helps, um, clarify a vision, figure out technically how to get there, support the process, and um, try as best as possible to to keep enough distance from it that you can still say, wow, this is great, that it isn't. And all of us know this, you know, once you've, I don't know, once you've painted a wall for five hours, you don't know if it's a good job or not. You just know it's done. And that's <laughs> It's one of the main dangers of being a, a producer is, you know, you you know, every snare hit, every drum hit um, from five months ago, you know why um, this sound was chosen versus the other one, blah, blah, blah. But is it good? That's really the the job of, of a producer to figure that out and to be the, the director of the whole project and keep it all together and make sure it's something people want to watch. Whereas a recording engineer is the person, it's kind of like the cameraman. So the recording engineer is the person that um, tries to take that vision from the music producer, director, and the artist, which may be the same person, right? and capture that and offer possibilities to, to make it sound good and in the end put it together. It's called mixing, taking all the parts and put it together and make a funky hole out of it. So that's it. And, you know, you've had a very uh, colorful career. I mean, obviously, you know, going in and out of Paisley Park, but, you know, before we even get to Paisley Park, you know, you're working at Pachyderm where Nirvana's In Utero, uh, legendary In Utero was, was recorded. Uh, but you were also involved in another rock band named Live and their album um, Throwing Copper. And that was a massive album for them so <clears throat> that's kind of an amazing early start how did you get involved with that particular project well it's actually not that it's uh, you know i shouldn't um i shouldn't pretend that i was a huge part in that i was the assistant engineer so you know on the road to becoming a full-fledged engineer assisting is like the first start you get out of school or wherever you learn the basic craft and then you work for a studio and you kind of learn the ins and outs of the specific studio, you know, where, you know, the screwdriver is and if they need that cable and how to put stuff together and you know who to call if something doesn't work and all that stuff. You kind of, you kind of, the, the you know, the, you're the PA more or less of, of the session. Right. That's what I was at Pachyderm. Actually, I wasn't there that long. I was there only in 1993. Uh, I did different stuff between that and the Paisley times, but um so the day I was hired, this was a very good day. It's the 17th of February in 1993. I met my wife and I got my job at Pachyderm. It was a good day. And the next day, okay. Nirvana started recording in utero at that studio. Unfortunately, completely without me because you don't get, you do, you don't take the new guy and put him on the session. Right now. You, you, you just don't do that. That's not very professional. But 
I cleaned Courtney Love's wine stains. I wore the hat that Dave Grohl set on fire to scare the producer. <laughs> and most of all, I had the the mixes six months before the album came out, which made me the probably I've never been any more popular before. <laughs> Rapidly Go back to the to the back. to the Dave Grohl hat fire. <laughs> What's the story? The story was that Pachyderm is a beautiful, beautiful place to this day. Actually, probably even more beautiful now than it was then, because um, anyway, Money, different story. right? Different, but very good story. Um, and what it is, it's kind of like it's a main house, which um, if you ever watched The Graduate or you know movies from that time, that's what it is. It's like some early '60s rich person in the country house, and the people that built the studio bought it. And then build a studio next to it. And it's, uh, once again, a beautiful place with windows, which at that time was very unusual. Paisley has no windows, so you never right. know what. Happens. There are ups and downs to that as well. Anywho, <clears throat> so in that studio, there's a, like a little lounge. And the producer of Nirvana, a guy named Steve Albini, apparently took a nap there. And Dave Grohl thought he'd freak him out. So he put on one of those, you know, gas station baseball hats put some right. lighter on it and set it on fire and then ran in and went <laughs> and trying to freak out <laughs> apparently just sl sh sh briefly opened one of his eyes and just went eh, and ignored him but we kept the hat and it was nailed to the wall for quite a while as a token of nirvana isms right. and i would ask more about the uh courtney love weinstein but you know yeah I i'm <laughs> i I have no Courtney Love stories. I, you know, I got tons of secondhand stories from Nirvana, but what, like I said, I wasn't there. I'm not going to pretend that I had anything to do with it. But the cool thing was, um, the Nirvana thing brought projects to Cannon Falls, Minnesota, which is a beautiful place, but not the place where rock history is usually made by people who want to party hardy. Right. Um, that wouldn't have come otherwise, and live being one of them. And so that was my my first really big um, project as an assistant. The engineer was a guy named Lou Giordano, was a great engineer, and the producer was uh, Jerry Harrison, formerly of Talking Heads. Yeah, and It was a huge learning experience for me because, uh, you know, in those days I didn't need any sleep, which was helped me during the 90s a lot. I remember and, those. I learned all these things. I had to do all those things that I had learned as concepts in recording school <laughs> and yeah. wing it. I think that was my only time of really fake it till you make it, um, at least some of it. And I had, I knew I had to deal with some egos and, you know, this was my impression at the time. I hope if he ever hears about it, but I felt like, you know, Jerry Harrison wasn't particularly a happy camper. Um, during that session, and the guys were so so. They have very different personalities, some more agreeable to company and some less so. But anyway, Jerry um, was a hero of mine, you know, Talking Heads was one of my favorite bands, still is actually. And then the experience of working with him kind of turned me off listening to Talking Heads for about a year, I would say, because every time I'd put him on, I'd hear the guy and the moment, you know. And um, so a lot of less um, impressive parts of my job presented themselves and I could make a, an informed decision whether I really wanted to do this. And the answer was yes. And that really helped me with print stuff later a lot. Uh, the intensity, you know, in terms of time, the necessity to um, figure out ways of doing things that you're really not equipped for. And I'm not necessarily talking about me, but like studio stuff. Right. And also the fact that I probably have to give up listening to Prince, which I have to this day. I mean, I, I listen to it every once in a while. and I'm, But, you know, I can't listen to it like you probably can, because I believe, you know, the reason I like Kiss when it came out has nothing to do with the reason he wrote it or, or performed it. So it was mine. It wasn't his song anymore. It was mine. It was my soundtrack. And uh, that soundtrack thing went away. So I, when I listen to Prince stuff these days, I hear somebody I knew very well. And I hear a mood or I hear 
a creative decision, but I don't hear music that is mine anymore. So that I learned on the live throwing copper session. Um, mm. The yeah. The, so so the, that's that's why you can't. That's why you have a difficult time listening to Talking Heads now, is because when no, you not hear anymore. it. But then there was that was briefly. But like Prince, Prince, I can't anymore. Prince, I mean, I can, but I'm not. I'm not doing it while I'm doing other things. I listen to Prince as like I'm having a conversation with somebody I know. It's not my soundtrack. Gotcha. And that's what it is. When you start working, be careful what you wish for. You know, if you start working with people that you really admire, you learn things about them that you didn't want to learn necessarily. <laughs> they they <laughs> no, remain with you, you see. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's an interesting thing. And it's, it's another thing I learned, you know, uh, then and then with Prince even more is that um, even if you're a huge fan, like I'm a huge Beatles fan, for example, um, and if you read all about it and you hear the podcasts and stuff, and then when you meet the person, you 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 realize at some point, unless you're completely tone deaf, that you don't know them at all. That there's a huge complete, there's a completely different thing. You can figure out somewhere where you're going to end up, but you don't know them at all. And once you get to know them. That may take you away from the thing you thought you knew. It's getting a bit too philosophical. But anyway, so there's the, that that mishmash of like, okay, what do I want to keep for myself? And uh, what do I give away that happens in a studio that I learned on the throwing copper sessions? No, and, and, and I, I understand that. And then they didn't give me fucking credit, even though I did get the platinum album. But, you know, so I learned a lot of things on that session. Yeah. I I can only imagine. Um, but yeah, I I get it. Um, and we were talking about the Beatles. I I remember reading John Lennon's uh, it was a biography that was done on him, and I thought, I just, I, I couldn't figure out if I liked him less, <laughs> or I just he just seemed to be a bit of a curmudgeon, uh, you know, kind of like a a hermit type of character in his later days, and just kind of went all just went really. Hey, wired, but uh, I try not to let that stuff affect how I listen to music because I realize that you know those come from different places, and a lot of times it's a really specific time period in somebody's life that you know they're, they're kind of you know committing. But I can imagine if you're intimately involved in the creation process of it, it just doesn't, you know, it's uh, it's got to be a difficult lesson for sure. But you know, speaking of being the in-house. Uh, how did you become Prince's in-house engineer at Paisley Park? How did how did that all transpire? Well, when I um, well, I got actually in the door with the help of a wonderful man named Tom Garneau, who, who uh, also an engineer of his. I think he came in round Graffiti Bridge-ish, but you'd have to ask him about that. But after the Throwing Copper assistant gig, um, I was part of a kind of a panel discussion about what it takes to be a good assistant engineer. And there were two others. There was one guy whose name I unfortunately forgot, and Tom. And at the beer afterwards, he said, look, I really like what you said. So if you ever want to get into Paisley, which I wanted to to begin with, um, I'll help you. And then it still took like, I don't know, like a year and a half. But then I, I was asked to show up there and I met, you know, all the cool people that worked there and assisted Tom on on a session and got the first run, which is probably for a fan was the best day of my, of I've ever had there because, you know, I assisted for a while. It wasn't too long of a session. And then Tom said, do you want to see the place? And I said, yes, I want to see the place. And, and uh, so he took me in the basement and he opened the vault. And there I stood amongst all those tapes that were like the gold of my, my youth. So oh, there's, let's go crazy. Oh, Oh, look at that. Is that dirty mind? And I was like, Ugh. you know, and, and next to it in the room, you know, in the room in front was the Oscar and outside was the bike from Purple Rain. It was just like, what the hell? And then in the back where the, the, um, the big film stage is, they were just uh, uh, rehearsing for a Japan tour. This was early 95. So I went on top of that stage put the guitar around me and went, and I'm to cause you any sorrow. So that was in terms of fanboyism, that was the day. That was really cool. So that's how I got in, in. And uh, the idea was, 
that I would be one of the so-called Prince pool because then the studio was still open to the public. So you could just book it like any other recording studio. Mm -hmm. And he had three engineers uh, working for him at all times called the Prince pool. So they could rotate people in and out um, because he, 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 because it's so intense. Right. And one of them was leaving and I was supposed to be the replacement. And, um, then it turned out that somebody else became the replacement, which at the time made me unbelievably unhappy, as you can imagine. But it turned out in hindsight to be a really good thing because I had about a year to really get to know the place. So over the next year, over the throughout 95, it was like an on-call system, meaning I wasn't there every day. But if they needed somebody, they called me. And then I'd be on that session, blah, blah. And then the next year, pretty much virtually a year later, um, the 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 same thing happened. One guy didn't want to do it anymore. And I was supposed to be the new Prince Pool guy. And at that moment, he decided to shut down the place to everybody. I was like, this is never going to happen. Um, so he shut down the place to the public. He canned the band. He canned the tour. He canned the management. I think the only person left at the time was uh, one person in the office, somebody at the front desk, his direct engineer at the time, Steve Durkee, and myself. And I, to this day, I don't know why I wasn't let go, but I guess I was just the spare. So I had, I had a um, a beeper, and uh, waited for it to beep, which it didn't. <laughs> so this was like in February, and then it beeped in July, and I was asked if I um, would assist Tom Tucker, who um, did you know many of the beautiful ballad mixes of the '90s, uh, like most beautiful girl in the world and stuff on a mix. So I said, yes, dropped everything I was doing. I was actually producing a pretty successful uh, a local band at the time or a band that turned out became very popular after our mutual album. Dropped that, gave the mix to somebody else, went in there and the place was had, hadn't been used in a couple of weeks and uh, Steve wasn't there anymore for whatever reason. So I put the place back together. It turned out that Tom Tucker didn't have any time to be there. So I was there by myself and in walks Prince with uh, um, with Kirk Johnson. Um, I, you know, is, is then programmer, co-producer. Mm -hmm. um, stands behind me with a guitar, strums a bit and goes, Hans, do you have time for me this week? Turned out I had time. And then, <laughs> I, had time, then I had time for four years. That's it. And the beginning was a bit tough, you know. And the beginning, he was, he wasn't sure if I was up to snuff. So uh, he never showed up. You were just pretty much right out of the gate. Yeah, he did. Tom never showed up. Um, but he didn't, you know, that's, that's just Prince feel. He never considered the fact that people needed to be scheduled and stuff. So he <laughs> called on that day to, to come in, just like when right. I was called. Tom said, no, I don't have time. So, you know, yeah. and then we went off, we went. And when I think about all of the, the people that you've worked with in, in that regard, before we start getting to the print stuff, I mean, when I think about, you know, No Doubt and Shaka Khan and, and Larry Graham and, and Lenny Kravitz and all these people that you got to work with. And, but before we get into that, I really want to know what it's like working with Eric Burden before we even get into this. Uh, that was a very pleasant, um, live thing i did uh i helped with in 17 years ago so uh, i mean he's such a i mean such an iconic character for those who don't know he was vocalist for the animals and also war and um i mean he's just he's like a funk legend you know it's just you know uh to see him in his you know yeah uh well it's good you got opportunity to work with him but out of all those people that i named off just just a few that I named off, no doubt, Shaka Khan, Larry Graham, Lenny Kravitz, any specific stories that you can think of that uh, may have stood out as far as, you know, wow, I would like to work with these people again in the future, something that was like really, really positive. You know, uh, Lenny Kravitz and uh, No Doubt and Cheryl Crow, those were like um, um, very brief projects that would happen because they wanted to work with Prince or right. they were the joy, until the ra ra um, raven to the joy from that sense. Well, well, that and and uh, you know, yeah, some other <laughs> didn't happen probably that much, or they you know they just come by to visit and then they play something. So I put them on a resume um, 
but if I'd have to shed stuff from my resume that is longer than a that is less than a week, then they you know some of them would be gone for sure. Um, but it's once again an interesting thing. For example, no doubt, beautiful people. That was a wonderful uh, working bit, and um, the song that's on their rock steady album that that Prince did called Waiting Room. I have two platinum albums outside for that for two days of work. I've done beautiful albums that weren't even released. So that's another learning experience when you work in the studio. You know, it's it's amazing what what happens, why. But to answer your question, I you know, Shaka Khan, Larry Graham, I'd work with any day. Larry, um, I know he's kind of aligned in the Prince community because he brought that Jehovah Witness thing uh, to the table. Sure. But he's a lovely, lovely man. And so is his wife. Uh, she's not a lovely man, but she she's a lovely lady. Um, they just brought a just a breath of friendliness and good cheer to Paisley Park. And I think they also, or Larry specifically, kind of um, started helped start the spin away from the pop star thing that Prince did throughout the 90s into the musician driven roadshow thing that happened uh, later on you know well i know that you know Love for for prince you know larry was uh, a hero to him i mean in many ways with you know sly and the family stone and 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 even grand central station which he even named one of his band after um but i think one of the, the turning points really was you know when when larry would come out and, and play with them and then you know if prince started to play an inappropriate song uh as story would have it larry would lead the stage and he would not participate in a song if it was you know song was highly inappropriate and you know i guess if prince had approached him when they said why are you you know leaving the stage during you know whatever song it was they're playing whether it was head or whatever it was and he was just like i'm just not you know it's just not my thing i'm just not you know i don't there's no need for profanity there's no need for you know vulgarities there's just it's just unnecessary and i think it flipped a switch with with prince but you know i guess a little bit later on i guess probably starting in 2000 probably that you know he just decided i remember exactly where i was standing uh, during the rainbow children tour one night alone tour uh where he said i'm not going to ever curse from the stage again and you're like okay Let's see if this sticks. And it did. <laughs> it stuck. But uh, I think Larry gets a lot of grief for, um, you know, the Jehovah's Witness thing. But, I mean, the reality of it is, is just, you know, every man makes his own decisions. You know, it's just, you know, you can't just pin it on somebody who was not there. He didn't give him drugs. He didn't do any of that stuff. So it, I just I feel like Larry's kind of catching the brunt of something that really wasn't ultimately his fault. But uh yeah, but it, you know that brings us back to what we discussed earlier, where um, people think they know people that they like, right? Even though they've never met them. And uh, you know, when when Prince went for the Jehovah's Witness thing, to me that was just that made complete sense because he was so um, you know, he was he was so ambitious and he was so um, he was he was so I win or I lose, you know. It was it was never in between anything. And the Jehovah's Witness thing, for me, completely fits with that. You either go to heaven or you don't. You're either on the right side or you don't. You know, there is no... Right. No, I don't need to get in religion here, but it worked for me. Me knowing him, I wasn't surprised at all. And and Larry, you know, is a lovely, lovely, lovely man. And he, you know, he would treat us, treat every one of us as nicely as he treated Prince. And that, to me, is a sign of a good person. So Larry's a good person. But in terms of music, I mean, that was great. That was fabulous. Uh, you know, we did one album um, within the Prince realm in the beginning. It was um, very much Larry doing his thing. And then in the end, Prince got more and more involved. So it got it got more purple as it went. But like in the beginning, you'd have stuff like, you know, the Rhythm King, that um, like that weird uh, drum machine that you can hear on Family Affair by Sly and the Family Stone. Actually, that very one we used um, to start stuff, you know. And so there would be a cool uh, collection of sounds that we worked with that 
weren't uh, current at the time, but they were just fun to do. And then same with Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan is just a force of nature, and she's yeah, she's proper. You know, I mean, I remember <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple of bonding moments with Prince that I remember, um, and that was certainly one of them. I um, for you or for her? Yeah. The, I remember a sound check. So we had like always a mic set up in the middle. And then I, you know, in the studio, not where we were recording, but on the other side of the glass. And then around it were some sound baffles to make, to not capture too much of the, the room sound. That's what you do. So I needed some level, meaning I asked her to sing a little bit so I could set my, my level for recording. And she wasn't even in front of the mic. She just kind of leaned on the side of one of those baffle, those artificial walls I put up. Played with her hair and did the most amazing wow thing that <laughs> Prince and I looked at each other and went like, my God, the queen's in town, you know? And it was it was lovely. And that was, that was awesome because those things all happened at the same time. I remember one specific day where we used Studio A and Studio B simultaneously. I, I would just go back and forth and uh, refuel them all with what they needed. And it was uh, Prince... Shaka Khan and Larry in one, and then uh, another producer that uh, Shaka brought along in the other, and Prince flitting back and forth, and me flitting back and forth. In one, in one um, studio, Shaka was recording her version of Larry's hair, and in the other one, um, I forget what the the single was, but like one of the the single, the first single of the Shaka album was being made, and that was just cool. That was a great night. Yeah. So that you know is a fabulous thing, anyways. I guess uh, that I should say about my particular career. There's some guys who have like three years of hipness because they make really cool sounds, whatever, and then there are some people that really just know how to make hits. So they 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 know how to read the current mood. Um, very well um, and then there are people that work for artists and and um, okay. cater to them and I'm the I'm that's what I am that's to this day I work really well with people people I know how to um, further people as they work in the studio and I enjoy them working together and that's what happened that night I had you know Larry Graham Shaka Khan Prince and he'll forgive me another great musician worked together and it didn't matter what the status was. It was just awesome. They all did their thing. They all pitched in. And the result is audible. So it's fabulous. Yeah. There were so many people that were in and out of the, the, the studios at that time during, you know, you had Sunny T's and um, Morris Hayes and just all those guys were just constantly in and out of the studios kind of on a regular basis. But, you know, you had made uh, alluded to, some things that you did not get credit for when you were working with Prince. And um, I'm always kind of curious because, you know, we, uh, this seems to be a recurring theme with him. Um, Lenny Kravitz uh, is, is a prime example. I mean, it's, uh, there are tons of material that Lenny and, and Prince did together. And a lot of people don't even know this, but he was one of the voices um, uh, singing on Dolphin. And I'm sure there's plenty of other things that he did um, that he's not even, and he wasn't even listed on Dolphin as a as a vocalist on the in the credits. So it's like, what are some prime examples of some some instances uh, with Lenny or and even yourself of some really significant contributions that you feel like you've made to you know some of those songs or some of those albums that you just simply just did not get credit for that you kind of wished would be write it on Prince Vault or wherever else. Anything else you can think of? Mm, you know, Lenny Kravitz, it, the, what I did was just him, you know, playing for the rave show and, and he coming by and doing stuff. So it wasn't that much. Yeah. And I actually am not aware of anything specific that he played on, certainly not during my time, but I know he did. I know they did stuff together, uh, but I couldn't tell you a song. So credits, you know, are the life fuel of people like me. Um, people don't really know what I do. And if I don't, if I'm not on the album, if it's not written on there that I engineered it or produced it, it's my word against somebody's. And the more time passes, the less proof you have in a way. I mean, it's easier these right. days because oddly enough, you know, most things I do these days, I, I actually have the sessions 
because I'm, I don't know, because of the digital world. Um, <clears throat> with prints, I got, I got most credit, uh, uh, hooked up just fine. But you know, some people, to me, to me, credits are easy. Either somebody did something or they didn't. And if they did it, they get credit. If they didn't, they don't get credit. If they did something on an album, let's say they did a background vocal and then you turn the background vocals off, you don't get credit because you're not audible in the final product. That's fine. But Prince was was one of those guys. He kind of gave out credit like uh, like the Queen gives out medals. It's kind <laughs> of okay. You deserve this thing, so hence you get credit. And like for example, the first thing, Emancipation, that I actually worked on intensely, where I did I would say about a third of all the engineering on that album. Um, so I went upstairs where Steve Park was doing the cover art and looked at the credits, and it said recorded by. I think it was Prince Ray Hanfeld, this was previous main engineer, and Tom Tucker. I was like, hmm, interesting. I'm working on this, and I'm, I don't even get credit. But I did get credit for this one word I said on uh, uh, before Holy River, where I say word two, and it says driver played by Hans by H and Buff. But I didn't get credit for the main work I did. So I said, no, 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 no. That's not how it's going to work. So I put all these people on there that worked on there, to my knowledge. Um, including the people that just went in there for three hours, like Peter Mokran, you know, worked on a mix that he, you know, that somebody else finished, but he he put some of his blood is in there. And it it was fine. You know, I did, always took great care to put everybody involved on something as, as long as I could. Like for Crystal Ball, I didn't have access to all the info anymore. So I just, I just checked, um, you know the 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 periods where the songs were from, and just popped all the engineers on there because I just and producers and musicians because I just didn't know. Uh, and misspelled Claire Fisher's name, which he was very gracious about and laughed loud. But anyway, so that's what I did. But usually, when I you know like Rave or 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 New Power Soul and uh, Shaka's album, Larry's album, where I was there, I made sure all the people were on there. As soon as I left, that ended, of course. So there are two songs of mine on oh, that I of mine that I had part in on um, in musicology, and there's one on 2010, and I don't have any credit because I was just you know out of sight. Which, one, which one's from musicology? Um, if I was the man, in, um, if I was the man in your life, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. And um, a million days. Wow, great songs. Yeah, they did more to it. A million days doesn't sound that different, but uh, it was many life. They added some more stuff, but that's that stuff that was done in a million days was done, I think, in '97. And if I was many life, we did in '98, something like that, in '99. You so, know, and 2010, same thing. So that's 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 that. Yeah. So I'm gonna come. I'm gonna kind of go a little bit left, and then we're gonna come back. Uh, come back to this because. Uh, there's there's a method to the madness. Um, many are not aware, but I'm a huge fan of Peter Gabriel. Um, I just you know uh, born in I was born in '68, so you know I kind of came up in you know you know hearing hearing him in Genesis, and then you know the security was probably like a staple in my cassette player for guy. It's just it just was. Uh, anyways, for those that don't know, shame on you. Uh, Peter Gabriel is just a just, just legend in, in my book, but um, many people only know, him, you know, from sledgehammer shock, the monkey, you know, in your eyes, whatever they were kind of turning out, but he was always way ahead of the curve in the audio world of things and uh, always testing the limits of just kind of what can be done with music and, and just the immersive experiences. And uh, that led to the creation of real world studios which I understand you've been doing a lot of work with recently and just kind of in 3D audio and headphones. Um, and you've kind of almost become like a little bit of a go-to expert for this. So this is going to lead back into another Prince question. But first thing is, how, how did that start as far as the, the 3D audio? Uh, I, I just, a, I guess, a, a passion for, for this. Well, how exactly did that transpire? Um, that, uh, I'm glad you ask. Um, you know, I'm not that nerdy, even though I look it, 
I <laughs> I I don't believe in making I don't believe in 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 having music jump through technical hoops. The point is for me to make music that reaches people. And so I've always been very skeptical about um, anything beyond stereo because who the hell has, you know, six or 12 speakers in their house properly signed up, uh, lined up, uh, set up, you know, measured, and then sitting in the middle to listen to to the music. Nobody. Actually, yeah, I, sh I got to tell you this because you're the Prince guy. So one of the reasons... I was I had that opinion that that was just for the chosen few audio audio files was actually you know started with the Prince thing, because the first more than stereo thing I had to do was actually the five point one mix of Rave uh, unto the year two thousand. So it was this beautiful show that was shot really beautifully with the people by the people who did the Beatles anthology, just high class project. Um, the highlight, you know, of my collaboration with Prince because. For the first time ever, he had, you know, he completely trusted me. I set up the sounds, recorded it. Um, Tom Tucker came in to 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 mix it um, with me, and it was it was just a great thing. And then the people from the whoever you know showed showed it for the first time. Was, I think it was pay per view, and then uh, whoever released it said, "We need a five point one mix." So I looked. Okay, what's a five point one mix? It's with all those speakers. Well, we're not gonna tear the mix apart so what we're we going to do so i heard about the studio in minneapolis that had a reverb so an artificial room generator that was 5.1 so i went to that place with a stereo mix we ran that through that reverb and that with the exception of one extra sound effect that i put in there is the 5.1 mix that you hear to this day on the dvd why am i telling you this i got so much grief or you know laurels for anything i did for him in stereo nobody's ever given a, a flying f about that mix because <laughs> nobody ever heard it people don't care people don't know you know maybe they put it on and they're like whoa and they watch it and they just don't know the difference so i thought that's not how it's going to fly that whole speaker thing and then about five years ago a friend of mine uh, played me a binauralized version of a uh, beatles and of a uh, pink floyd 5.1 mix and binauralized means really there's yeah. a binaural beats for okay i've got to i have to find this <laughs> oh that's really easy you could make it yourself actually it's not that hard uh, yeah. but it's the way it works is you have there are some tools that uh um fool your head into believing that even though you have headphones on you're in a in a three-dimensional room full of speakers more or less. And that, even though what I heard there now looking back didn't sound that great, but it worked. And I thought that was a huge game changer. So if you put on headphones, everybody has headphones. And you can, you know, listen to 3D music, as I like to call it, immersive sounds. I don't know, sounds like scuba diving to me. Um, if everybody can hear it as you are on the bus or you're, you know, you, you're using music as you use music for, for yourself as a soundtrack of your life to go from A to B, to relax, to jog um, in the kitchen, wherever it is you, you do that. Um, then that music has a chance. And then I got into trying to figure out how you make music and sound specifically for it, because I figure, you know, nobody, if you, if you think about stereo, right. Um, if you think about the Beatles stuff from the early sixties, it's like the, all the band is on the left side and the voice on the right, right. That's mm -hmm. not that's just not mono, but that's not creative. If you listen to Pink Floyd stuff or 80s stuff, generally, you know, that's made for stereo. You have stuff moving, you use rooms and all that stuff. So I figure you need to make music for 3d to make it work. And that's how I got into that. And that's how I met um, Peter as well and his crew. Because uh, I was, uh, he asked a mutual friend, um, Andrea Sennheiser, the guy who owns the company with, you know, who makes the headphones and the microphones and all that stuff, that, you know, who he should talk to about 3D sound for headphones. And he said, Dr. Buff. So, Dr. Buff. We hooked up. So that's how the conversation started. And I had been to Real World before because it's just a wonderful studio. And uh, just, you know, booking it for projects of mine. I was trying to remember and when I knew I was going to be talking to you about this. I was trying to find um, the CD that he had created. It was like one of the first oral 
immersive experiences that he had. I was trying to remember the name of that project too. It's John uh, Blake uh, did it. Yeah, I. Um... Yeah, but it was just, it was like this. It was like a whole thing. It was, and he was just always so ahead of his time. And so, yeah, I was just fascinated that that you had gotten involved with him. I mean, besides the rave into the year 2000 project, was there any other 3D element stuff that you can think of? Or even, you know, I don't even know what the difference is in recording. And you know, how do you prep for a 5.1 recording? Uh, is it is it something in the way that you're recording mic wise? Or is, is there anything that you did that you've applied to Prince's uh, material other than the rave into the 2000? The Prince? Uh, yeah, I didn't know how that worked then. It uh, you know, really took off after I left Prince's place, and I've done some very nice uh, concert uh, uh, 5.1 mixes throughout the zeros for the Scorpions and others. Um, but yeah. once again, nobody listened to them. You know, like for any stereo mix, the artists are full of opinions what should be changed, and it's their right to do so. You know, it's their vision, blah blah. But for the 5.1, they didn't even listen to it. Nobody, you know, nobody cared. So there, but you know. To get back to your question, uh, what do you need to record? I'm not going to geek you all out, um, but that's exactly what I'm into. I'm currently working. Um, I'm trying to help artists get creative with a sense of 3D. And for that, you need to capture some of it. And recording techniques, special ones are applied. And just the fact that you asked that question makes you smarter than most record executives in the whole planet. Because <laughs> I just don't know. And I don't blame them because, you know, most people think that whole 3D or 3D, by the way, is is the sound of it all. And uh, Dolby Atmos is a way of bringing it to people, a very current way. So now a lot of things on Apple Music and stuff are in Dolby Atmos. And most people think that it's just, you know, reposition stereo. So something that was in two speakers before is now being moved behind you and above you and whatever. And I don't think so. I think you need to have, make special music for it and then it becomes impressive for for the artists as well. So kudos to you for your insight because that's exactly it. And that's what I'm doing with the real world people. I show them what's possible and um, they listen, which is great. Um, and beautiful things come of it. Well, and I definitely want to check out the, the Scorpions live because I really, I laid, you know, I loved the Scorpions back in the eighties and, and I can imagine, I mean, you being from Germany, did you geek out at all getting the opportunity to work with them? I mean, cause I know from what I understand, I've never been to Germany, but from what I understand, uh, you guys love your Scorpions. <laughs> Actually, oddly enough, I think they're much bigger in the States here. There's really? a lot, a lot of fans here, but yeah, it's one of those, there's a saying, uh, in German that the profit never counts for much in their own country. So if you're a prophet in other places, you're being hailed as a prophet in your own country. You're just the guy from down the road. Right. And that's pretty much what it's like with the Scorpions. You know, they're mildly embarrassed, but proud at the same time. Whereas, you know, in the States, people our age, I was born in 69. Yeah, um, about the same age. Yeah. yeah. They, a lot of people that I know, you know, picked up a guitar playing to Rock You Like a Hurricane or Big City Nights. Or whatever. Of course. <laughs> and me, you know, it's not, it's not my thing. And I think that's one of the reasons I work so well with them because I am not a fanboy. Um, I've I've got to know their music um, by working with them. I, I have a very extensive music collection and all the money of my childhood and, and adolescent years went into CDs. Yeah. There wasn't a single Scorpions among, among them. Now I have them all. Um, but it, that's great because I really like them. They're just awesome dudes. You know, uh, I really get along well with them. And um, I can sit in there as somebody who didn't drink the Kool-Aid ever and go, "What? Well, that's not really Scorpions, is it? We're not making a Def Leppard record. So the last album that I actually recorded, you know, um, I also produced, co-produced with him. Nice. Uh, so I would be in there and go, nah, nah, that's not, isn't that what we wanted? Didn't we want to do this and that? And they go, yeah. I'm like, well, that's not what you're doing, is it? And, you know, that type of stuff. So yeah, that's good. Yeah, so that's my Scorpions thing. So great, great, great. I wasn't geeking out on it, but I was very, very proud that I I was chosen, and that they enjoy working with me. Once again, that's what I'm into. I like being in a room with creative people, and then we start 
with nothing and in the end there's something that wasn't before that people enjoy out there that's why i geek out about and and i can certainly yeah. i get that a lot with the scorpions yeah. it's another thing and then i'll stop with the scorpions uh monologue but the further east i go from here so you know russia asia uh, whatever the prince thing doesn't do much for me but the scorpions are huge like i was in thailand and uh the the best selling albums there ever are michael jackson bad and a scorpions ballad compilation go figure <laughs> i wouldn't have saw that coming well there you have it oh my gosh well you know and to kind of speak a little bit more about prince and some of the you know you're mentioning binaural beats and things like that um well you weren't talking about specifically about beats but the binaural recording process i mean one of the things that always fascinates me uh, when you listen to a Prince song dozens of times, you know, you always, it seems like you always hear something different each time that you hear it. I think it's just because there's so many different layers that, you know, may or may not come through based on what you're listening on or where you're listening, but those, those little pieces and, and, and elements that are just kind of buried in the background. Um, and you can only, all the way you can hear them is by is listening to them in, in headphones um, and paying very close attention. Are, are there, Anything during, I mean, imagine there probably are, but are there hidden or really slick elements that you can think of that he buried in some songs or that you buried in some songs where you're thinking to yourself, yeah, no one's going to hear that. No one's going to pick up on that. That may be like a, a really awesome Easter egg, like some type of really unusual sound effect or something that, uh... and, and on top of that, to add to that question, uh, did he ever really mess around with anything subliminal or binaural? Because binaural, like you none, did. none of that happened. I mean, my first binaural, uh, true binaural experience was, like I said, five years ago. So um, there was none of that. Yeah. You know, Prince was a perfectionist in terms of his creative vision, but technically not at all. He did a lot of things um, that you don't do if you follow the rules um, and he just, he had no sentimentality for recording techniques. It was about do it quick, capture it, capture the lightning in the bottle because I have lots of lightning. I don't care about the bottle. That's really what it was about. And, um, uh, you know, if I listen, when I listen to the stuff that I was involved with at the time, if I would have had more influence on the sounds, um, it would be completely different because you know i think it was the current style of the times the late 90s didn't help him very much because um people weren't back oddly enough to the drum machines that prince used in the beginning that clearly sound like fake drums you know there but but with a style like that whole stuff that he did in the beginning you know that right. whole erotic city type stuff the lindrum that's not a real drum kit. And you hear it's not a real drum kit. It's just awesome in its own way. And then later on, you know, you, you actually record drums, real drums. And this these days you have like samples of real drums that sound like real drums. The, t the, the, the artificial drum sounds of the late 90s were kind of in the middle. They sounded too real to have the, the, the vibe of like a Lindrum, but it didn't sound real enough to, to be... Um, to have the hmm, the warm wholesomeness of real drums, so <clears throat> a lot of the sounds in there just these days, looking back, sound kind of cold and um, don't have the hugeness that they could have used, and um, yeah. um, that aren't as special. Um, and I would have loved to have changed that. I don't know if if I cared at the time, but looking back, I I it, it would have been much better and much more um, for the ages if we if we wouldn't have been so much off the time. Um, so those are the sounds that are in there. In in those days, he also used um, a format, which was 48 track tape, digital tape. And he tended to over arrange. One of the things I really um, enjoyed uh, when I worked for him is to get the old tapes out. If let's say Morris Hayes would need some strings that he could, trigger during the live show so he would have it in a sampler and you wouldn't have a string section with you so he would, Morris would have the sample on his keyboard and he would play the actual strings of let's say pop life 
and I would be the lucky guy who could go get the tape and hit solo and check out all the individual parts, which for me clearly was amazing. Yeah. And I noticed that on the old stuff, there are very few uh, components. If you take something like um, When Doves Cry, there's drums, there's not even bass, there's the guitar, there's keyboards, and then there's, I think, eight or so or maybe 12 vocal tracks the the lead vocal and then that one that big choir <laughs> that thing and that's it that's that's the hugeness of the thing the song is it and the 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 sounds are well chosen for the song in my day he would just throw everything in there and then you have stuff like you know probably the low point from my very subjective view uh arrangement wise that i was involved in was that cheryl crow cover on rave every day is a Rhining road that is so full of stuff it was pretty much unmixable so it would sound cool in there so there isn't much hidden stuff it's just everything all at once and that's one thing i learned from him when you mix he once told me um you should mix like you're mixing for a video so imagine you have a live video and then there's a little keyboard like dick dick ding for example and the camera goes on Morris's hand, then you need to hear that lick. So meaning if there are specific little interlude things, feature them in your mix, make them louder just at that spot. So if the keyboards before just go ba, 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 and then goes dun, 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 and then they go back to ba, 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 at that spot, make it louder. So there aren't many hidden things. And I can't think, uh, I can't think of any uh, purposely hidden thing that we put in there in the background to fool to either for humor reasons so people could find it or to put out a message and stuff he was always very very both as a guy and as a producer and musician he was very very upfront with what he wanted to say and then he said it and he said it loud i'm still geeking out a little bit that that that's your voice going where to <laughs> well, yeah, oddly enough once again if you go i haven't checked in a while but if you go on the prince website right and you go through the albums no engineering credits but it says music blah blah, blah and then hans martin buff driver so my credit that's <laughs> one of the beauties of having that freaking long name <laughs> and that's, it, you have a bigger credit than anybody else if yeah, um, that, that's the one where he's uh he just tells you anywhere anywhere and he gets on does his little cell phone conversation or whatever yeah that's virtually what happened. He came, you know, he called me in the studio and said, um, Hans, um, say where to. So I said, where to? And he said, thank you. And that was that. <laughs> so the act of, of generating that credit took substantially longer than the content itself. What's the first album that you worked on with Prince? That would be the one, Emancipation. Emancipation. So yeah. let's uh, look at this just for a second with Emancipation. This is his... Uh, knowing that this is going to be his calling card for his uh, contractual release from Warner brothers. What, what do you feel is different about this? I mean, I, obviously you don't have anything to compare it to because it's your first album working, but you know, uh, do you feel an increased pressure in the studio? I mean, did he come out the gate saying it's going to be three albums or did it just become three albums? Yeah. Um, what are some distinct things you remember? Because again, this is going to be something that's really was going to be a massive thing for him. Um, he, he, he felt like he needed to make a statement more than anything else. Um, um, so what, what kind of impact do you think that had on, on the recording process and everything else? It's an interesting question. I, you know, when people ask me about Prince, I feel like I need to point out that he wasn't one to communicate his intentions very much. Right. So he wouldn't he wouldn't like have conversations with us and have like philosophical explanations of what we were actually doing. We were just doing it. And when I showed up, you know, I like I said, I did about a third of it. And I showed up in July and we were done in September, October. So just to be ready for the release in November. Um <clears throat> When I showed up, it was already three albums. It was just some things, some content got off, new songs were put on, some of the songs were augmented, the um, running order changed. One thing that happened along the way is that everything had to be exactly 60 minutes, which was fun for me. 
I remember that night when we when we did all those edits and um, recorded. I forgot about them. that. I forgot that each, for those that don't know, each CD on Emancipation is exactly 60 minutes. So that's like, got to be like a... To the frame. Yeah. It was, may have changed the mastering a bit, but what I delivered was 60 minutes to, you know. That's crazy. Yeah. Star time. Um. And that's really that's really it. It was a lot of sequencing, a lot of um, putting it together. But like the general headline was already set; that hadn't changed. So, yeah. and I heard there was a lot of internal feedback regarding you know the cover that he chose and and everything that that kind of went with the the marketing of it. Um, how do you feel like? Um, I mean, that's your first Prince project. You got to be you know super. Uh, stoked about this this is you know your first you know your your first uh, album with him uh, so you gotta feel uh, definitely a, a sense of pride do you feel like um, do you feel like it was marketed correctly do you feel like um, could have been a more successful could they done more with it uh, what, what are your overall thoughts now that you're on the other side of the release of, of it I think it's a great record to this day yeah and um, it's overwhelming, but it was meant to be, you know, I mean, there's sort of certain albums work because they are so much. Um, and I, the way I look at it as a listener now, or as somebody who's looking at the whole picture, um, it's kind of the, you know, the, the culmination of the whole nine, the, you know, that period that started after graffiti bridge up to then it, is focused on that album. And I feel like in that album is both gold and come and uh, diamonds and pearls in terms of style, but he kind of put it into a narrative that worked in a row, you know, it's like, I feel it's kind of about life and love and then. Right. Liberty or emancipation, whatever you it, want to call it. Like it's all over the, map. the thread that is is there and you don't have to do the whole thing you can just enjoy it and you can take it at face value whatever however you want to look at it i am a big fan of grown-up records you know there's like um me as a beatles fan let me say as an example let's say um actually maybe double fantasy by john lennon or or shortly thereafter um tug of war by paul mccartney which is the one with ebony and ivory and many much better songs um they're not their most adventurous. You don't hear the passion of youth that you have, let's say, in Prince's case and Sign of the Times and stuff like that. Um, but you have somebody at the peak of what they've learned through their musical life in a life position where they have something to say, where they're solidly on both their feet. It's not as exciting as a, oh, I'm on drugs or I'm so lonely, or bitch left me, or whatever it is you write albums about that are uh, intense. But they're solid, and they just shine. They're never the right. most popular because they're just so at peace with themselves, but they're great. I like them. And I think Emanci Emancipation is that for him. It was kind of the peak, you know, the solidness of what he, of his insights up to that point. And then afterwards, it all fell apart, too. You know, if you, um, you know, I feel like I was at the changing moment um, from the rise to the point, okay, now I'm where I'm where I'm at. I have complete control. I don't even have the record company anymore. That slave thing is taken care of. Now, what do I do? How do right. I, how do I do all, all these things? And then, you know, Rainbow Children, you mentioned. I love that record because he had, you know, he had a fire on it. Yeah. Even if I don't care much about the fire, but it it was audible great. It was a great record. And I was really mad at the time that that was the first album after my time. Um, and yeah, that, I think, you know, that, that taught him that he could do whatever he wanted to do and people would follow. And that's what he was going to do from then on. If he made a pop record, he would do the pop thing like he did with musicology um if he would the, would have done the same thing with emancipation and if emi wouldn't have folded maybe that would have been the same thing maybe he would have really played that album for a year and a half or two years who knows 
now he recorded Rainbow Children entirely on uh on a Mac. And uh on a Mac. On a on, on a MacBook, which I thought was it, well, that's that's what it says in the, the credits. It says something to the effect that it, it was all recorded on um uh what's the uh the uh, Mac audio pro well it's an audio program it's a Mac, not just a Mac. Yeah. But uh the live album, the live album I think is just is off the board, but like the Rainbow Children is a proper record with tape and everything. It sounds amazing. Yeah, it's yeah, I, I'm actually surprised that you weren't involved in that because that seems to have your it seemed to have the, the sound that you were perfecting for yourself. And you know, you know, just yeah, everybody has their own distinct sound. It seems certainly like an album that you uh uh you would have been involved in. Do you feel like uh do you feel like you've located I mean I imagine you probably have by now but is there something distinct with the sound in the way that you record uh do you have like something that's that's a a, a fingerprint that you uh I think that is a huge compliment thank you because you know I really think that sounds great it was recorded um by Femi Gia who um um is one of the engineers that came several times I think the only engineer actually um he did uh, Batman and Love Sexy and then uh, came back after the Rafe show. So early 2000, he came in. Then we worked in tandem for a while. And then I left and, and he continued. Do I have a musical handwriting? I think there is an audible stuff that third parties hear, but I think it's subtle enough that it's not like a lot of mixing engineers where you hear that they mixed it, which, you know, these days is the way to go. So there are a lot of big people, you know, ah, okay, clearly that's a blah mix. Even if I don't hear the band, I know, okay, this is mixed by Tom or the LG. Right. Um, and that's a blessing and a curse. I, Either way, it's a conscious de decision on my part because um, one of the benefits of having come back from the States to Europe is brings us back to the radio discussion from earlier um, that it's, it's not as um, divided in genres. So, you know, in the States, if I would have stayed there, I most likely would have been attached to the funk R and B thing, which wouldn't have been a bad thing. I'm just pointing it out. Right. And I wouldn't have been able to make, a Metallica album. You know what I mean? Whereas here, I, you know, just, I work with the alternative approach of the real world people. I work uh, as a very genre specific hard rock dude for the Scorpions. And I just came back from working with a local hip hop outfit. So it's, you know, I can jump back and forth, um, which is great for me because it keeps me happy, but it's not good for business because people don't come around and say, oh, I want the Han sound. Um, but I can help them all. So if you hear a handwriting that I'm not aware of and it sounds as good as Rainbow Children, I am in, man. You're my favorite listener. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just got this oral. So, uh, Pro Tools was the was the program I was trying to Yeah, yeah. yeah, that could yeah. be. I, I'm the guy who introduced Pro Tools to, to Prince Land. And I know he went really? it again and went back to tape. Actually, I'm the guy who got him back on analog tape and introduced Pro Tools at some point. And not as a recording format, um, but like just to edit and make things easier on, on his workflow. Now, if I remember the story correctly, you were involved in, in Crystal Ball also, yeah. and that you were um that you went and you had to go and physically into the vault and get these songs and then digitize them as well and uh i i you know we, we were we were born about the same time i'm 68 and and so i remember very very distinctly in the early 90s uh getting a hold of crystal ball uh of the bootleg and um it just it, there was a very very different tonality to it um crystal ball the song seems like i remember it being a lot longer than what was released even though what was released is long seems like i remember crystal ball being a much longer song um 
and I obviously I probably have the cassette somewhere around here, but um, what are some of the decision processes that you have to make when you're taking something like that in, in an analog format and digitizing it? And is there any loss that's involved there or what, you know, just some of the adventure that is crystal ball, what you remember. Once again, that part is a beautifully uh, eloquent observation of what you should do. <laughs> you know, if I would, if I would transfer this today, I would very much make sure that um, my tape machine is set up for that specific type of tape and the right tones and the right level. And then I go through a really nice, uh, what's called an interface, which turned, you know, trans turns the analog sound into the digital information, which is then stored in the computer. Then the whole um, crystal ball project, all of it is like a two week adventure. That's it. End of crystal ball. So really? first, two weeks. Uh, yep. He, he, he put up a list of things and I'm the first engineer, I think uh, since um, Paisley Park had been built that didn't have the combination to the vault, which is a good thing because he never thought I, I bootlegged. Rightfully so. It's probably the last thing I would ever do. You know, some ultimate treason in in the music world. Um. Anyway, so I went down there with, I don't know. Usually when that happened, he sent his bodyguard down with me, Aaron. Um. I don't know if he had to suffer this time or if he just waited or whatever. But anyway, I went down there with the trolley, and the list, and looked for tapes, and then I popped the shit up there. And I trans, and then he listened to it, and I transferred it to a DAT tape, which is the low lowest of low grades in digital, sixteen bit forty four one. That's what we did. Wow. Then I popped that into the even then ancient and clumsy editing system that I used for the entire time there, which I didn't choose. It was just there. One of the reasons I really wanted Pro Tools because I had Pro Tools at my house. Um. But they had this was an Akai system. It's just anyway, I was pretty fast. <laughs> but that's that's the that's the process. And then one of the things he liked to do, uh, it's actually one of the more creative, um, the, probably the most creatively uh, independent task I had there, which was he would. Uh, we did that with I did that with Crystal Ball, and I did that with Days of Wild on that project, and with any other song, new song he did, he would say, "Cut out the beef." So let's say the new song would be eight minutes long. It would be like based on a on a beat that Kirk programmed that's eight minutes long. And then he would write a song through there. And then we'd do a rough mix and then he'd give it to me and say, cut out the beef. And then I would just listen to it musically with producer ears and go like, this is where I'm getting bored. Maybe we should take that out. And then I'd suggest that to him as I go, no, why don't we, and all of a sudden that eight minute song would be 520 or 450 or something. And the same with Crystal Ball. He said, edit it. And so I went and made it a bit more concise. Um, and he uh, approved the edits. I said some edits, some he didn't. How long was the original Crystal Ball? Am I remembering it correctly? That it was a really long song. It was really long. I mean, what is it now on, on Crystal Ball? I want to say it's like 10, 11 minutes as it is. I, I, was, I thought it was yeah. went down to like 7 or 8, but I think it was like 12 or 15. Um, you know, as long as a tape would be. That would make sense. <laughs> um, so probably something like that. Same with the day, Days of Wild live thing. That's on the third uh, Crystal Ball disc. Yeah. And, and so with, same with uh, Chlorine, Bacon Skin. And uh, yeah. See, to me, that seems like one of those ones that you would, you would, to me, that song just seems to drone on. For me personally, I, I know that people, that people are going to be like, sacrilege. Yeah, they always do. It, but the reality of it is, is that there's really there's there's nothing to that song really much about. It. You know, you're you're enjoying the humor of it, but you know, it's like hearing the same joke over repeatedly. It's just okay. But that as well was twice as long, so you can thank me <laughs> suffering more. Oh my god! <laughs> so and, I'm so great. You know, that's that's the thing. That's the thing about Prince. You know, he was he was an enormous Prince fan. He, re he Prince thought that guy Prince was just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you listen, you know, me, I personally like Chlorine Baked Skin because I like weird, I like stuff like Why Don't We yeah. Do It in the Road by the Beatles, you know. Where, oh, yeah, it's a great song. So, well, you know, a lot of my more pop-oriented people is like, 
they started foaming at the mouth. It was like, why would you put that on a record? Yeah, um, revolution too. Yeah, yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if y you, you know, I like it because it's uh, all that stuff, and then I I remember cutting it. You know, when he changes beat and boom, boom comes in, and so it's it's somewhat of a concise build up and blah blah blah. But Prince, you know, he liked everything on there equally. What I thought. I would have taken some of that cool stuff like Splash or Wonderful Ass that was on the list as well, but didn't make the cut. Or Roadhouse Garden on there. And he thought for some reason that that remix of Tomorrow was just as valid as that stuff. And that's something I learned during that project is like he doesn't see a difference between the creative worth of what he did right now. Take from last year. Uh, compared to some treasure from the 80s. So you were there for Celebration 2000, correct? Yes, that was my last deed, actually. And they actually, during that period of time, I guess there was, I was not there for the Celebration 2000, but they uh, uh, were presenting songs for the audience to pick. And... Uh, Seems to hear like there's lots of stories where they were saying, okay, we have all these songs and you pick what you're most interested in um, to make it. I don't know what the, the thought process was. I, I know that one of the um, selections that I guess the audience had made at some point in time was that they wanted the, a, a ballad album from Prince, like all of his best ballads on like a, a ballad album. So I, I guess because of your look of, uh, I don't remember this <laughs> that you may not be able to answer this question, but um, I was wondering if there was anything that you had worked on personally that got voted down in that mix on celebration 2000, because apparently I don't know how long of a period of that was, but I don't know if it was like a, a, a one hour of a day during that celebration that they did it. I don't, I don't know, but uh, I do remember stories about that. And I was wondering as somebody who is behind the board mixing these songs and hearing your songs going up for votes, you know, what your personal feelings may have been during that period of time. I don't know how much you remember of that or not. None at all. I, I, wow. I, I don't remember that at all. Um, but it anyway, it wasn't put, I don't remember. Well, let me yin yang on that. It's like, you know, during the celebration, my job was to sit in the studio and explain it. So whatever happened around that, I have no, I didn't have any part in. I remember the, the show he did were the revolution guys, the Minneapolis revolution guys came on stage and, you know, Matt Fink and, and Bobby Z and, uh, was Matt Brown there? I don't remember, but yeah, I think so. Um, but that's it. So I didn't, I didn't get much of the thing that, that happened around it. Um, but I also don't remember, um, Getting, getting, you know, any results from from fan things. But having said that, that process was fairly regular because one of the cool things that happened during those after hours parties at Paisley Park is that there would be a DJ, mostly Brother Jewels, who just passed, which is uh, makes me very sad. Great guy, mm -hmm. and he would do his, you know, he would he would he would do his uh, DJing thing, which he did very well, and then we'd slip in a current mix of something we'd be working on. And we'd observe, A, what it would sound like in a um, club situation, yeah, sonically, and how it would go down. And that would inform a lot of decisions. And I thought that was a really good way of doing it. Did you ever, ever play something and go, well, yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> oh, many times. But my, mostly sonically. You know, he didn't really care that much, but we just take, oh, okay, that's too dull, or it's not loud enough, or, you know, that type of stuff. We just go, I have to do the mix again, or work on the mix. Or people wouldn't get up, or they'd sit down, or oh, they'd sit never, down, that's never good. Song, you know, that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's never good when they sit no, down. Fine. Seriously, that's, you know, you have to have, you, and even in that, you know, you don't, you don't get any emotional bit in there. It's like, same with Prince. You, you know, you have to have this, Kill your children, a sentiment, um, um, approach to 
what you're working on, even if you like it. That's what I talked about earlier about what it means to be a producer. You have to you have to look at it from a, a, a neutral point of view and go like, ah, okay, this is where I want to go with this. Does it work or doesn't it? And if it doesn't, well, you just have to keep on working at it. It's not it's not it's not a slight or it's not a catastrophe. It's just a way of doing it. And Prince was that way too. I mean, that's one of the things I learned from the guy. It's not it's out now on that um um sign of the times deluxe thing that came out. But if you listen to Forever in Your Life, um is that what it's called? Yeah. Da, 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 yeah. Yeah. Sign of the Times. Yeah. The big recording yeah. mistake that Susan Rogers made that ended up being uh historic. What mistake is that? Uh, he it was supposed to be singing along with it, and Susan started it at the wrong place, and that's the reason for that stuttering, uh, the the kind of mirroring uh, uh, vocals. So the vocals were kind of the vocals were ahead of where he was actually singing. So that so uh, it was a mistake, and and I Susan was freaking out in the studio when. Uh. Like, oh no and he was like no no keep it i like this and so that's the reason why it's kind of got that offset uh you know the offset lines oh and, that's cool uh, i didn't know that part but yeah. if you listen to the one that's on the on the deluxe album that version you hear those acoustic guitars mm -hmm. you know which is which is just makes it very pretty and very sweet and most of us would have done it like that it's like there comes a time in every man's life you know and just yeah that when I had to remix that for whatever I had to remix it for, for his live show, that blew my mind because he had the cruelty or creative insight to mute it, even though he put that in there. He turned that off and all of a sudden it had a completely different vibe and was substantially better as far as I'm concerned, or more special. And that is really something you need to be able to do as a producer um, is to take things away that you've fallen in love with. Or or spend a lot of money on you know I mean take all the songs like um, sometimes it snows in April or uh, Ballad of Dorothy Parker that have stuff on it that really took a long time to do but mm -hmm. aren't on the finished version so like the I think the horns is it on on uh... Ballad of Dorothy Parker yeah they just released that um, yeah. which when I first heard it I didn't like it I I but now it. I, I kind of like it, but it, I, when I interviewed Eric um, a while back, he said, "He said, yeah, he had me do the horns to Ballad of Dorothy Parker, but when I heard it, I was like, why? There's like no yeah. reason to, to put this on here, but yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. yeah, so somebody worked on that for eight hours, and then you just turn it off. And it's the same, like, uh, sometimes it snows in April, which is a song that made me a Prince fan, really, in the end. Finally won me over. Um, that has a full orchestral arrangement on it. Full. So you, you spent at least like what thirty grand on that, because you know you had Claire Fisher, one of the best arrangers in the business, arrange that. Go with a full herd of classical musicians into a huge studio in L.A., which none of this was cheap, and then listen to it and go, "Nice, I'll turn it off." <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it was actually released. Uh, it was actually released that way with the orchestral arrangements in Japan only, if I remember correct. Okay. And uh, I heard it and it was just, I think they called it the cinematic mix. I think is what you referred to it as. Uh, okay. But yeah, it's, it's definitely very, very different. Um, it's just, it's just amazing. Just uh, maybe, maybe I should tell people this who aren't from music business. So it's the same recording. It's not like a different recording. It's just the same recording with an additional part added to it. And then you can turn that on and off. That's what you do in a mix. So being able to go through there and rake through it and throw away 30 grand, it's worth of effort just because you think it sounds better. That is greatness. Oh, absolutely. It was great that way. Very much so. And uh, I want to be respectful of your time. So I only have a few more questions. Um, but before I get into those last few questions, I did want to ask about chaos and disorder. That album was so different than anything. Like, if I have rock fans that are are good friends of mine that I'm trying to get them into Prince, I'm obviously not going to head them down the ballot. So, like, well, you like rock? Check out Chaos and Disorder. 
why was chaos and disorder so different? <laughs> I mean, obviously it was because musically it was so sonically different. It was more rock uh, than anything else. But was there something different in the way that was was something not, not to get personal, but was something going on in his life, or was he just in a different vibe or different mode? What was diff- so different about chaos and disorder? I have absolutely nothing to do with that album. That That's what you did. No, that was that's in between. That's in '96, yes, but like that was, I think, the last thing that Steve did, my predecessor. So in the time where my beeper was idly, <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Uh, you but, but, um, you'd have to ask him about that, but I know, you know, I mean, um, it's obvious to me that Prince himself mixed it. You see, you have to know that, um, um, he was raw raw but he was also you know sometimes when you're in the creative process you you find your little workflows that help you do whatever it is you do and the danger is that you feel like ah those workflows are the reason that i do what i do so if i don't do those specific workflows it's clearly not good you know what i mean right and and prince had that a little bit with his fucking mixing thing that because he could have had both you know you could could have taken some stuff and then have people mix it that have a fresh input on it or are specifically for a genre or whatever and have his vibe. And um, I would say at least half of every album I worked on are inspired rough mixes, meaning very quick mixes um, that then were augmented with stuff. Right. Chaos and Disorder isn't very well mixed. It's a wonderful, I like listening to it. I think because that that to me is like, I don't know. It has like the crazy uh, energy of Prince that I like mixed with rock. And that's really cool. But I think if Steve would have been allowed to have more of a hand in actually mixing it, it would have been so much bigger and and bigger, better. But I think, um, and this is secondhand information, but I'm confident that it's true. So I'll just... uh, spew it out i think part of it is just it's one of those albums that he had to give to warner to get out of the country yeah With, um, and, and the, the same time the way. that sorry the vault old friends for sale it was kind of very similar which was made at the same time that was also made at that time in my you know I'm still kind of on staff but not the main guy yet in that time where I had nothing to do with Paisley but wasn't out officially um they made that at the same time. So it was delivered, those two albums, and then just uh, Warner Brothers and their wisdom decided to release it when they did, the vault thing. Um, I don't know why he then went out and did some uh, TV gigs for Chaos and Disorder. I don't know. Maybe that was part of the deal as well. Yeah, but that's, probably something that's why. And the al- You know, the songs on it, they weren't recorded then, all of them. They were taken out the vault from the years before from that power trio stuff that he did with Sonny and, and Mike. So they weren't all recorded specifically for that album. I'm sure as with any other album, it was a collection of things that kind of fit together that he wanted to put out. And then it was, they were augmented and maybe one or two songs um, were done afresh. This is completely my assumption. I'd like to point out. So if you really want to know what happened, find Steve Durkee. I might just have to do that answer that question because that's just one of those standout albums that just sounds so different than anything else it's just uh uh just like you say it's not really well mixed but that kind of adds to that raw live feel to it that uh, a lot of people that like heavier tracks kind of you know if if i were ever approached in you know like Let's make a new version of Emancipation and stuff. Or an anniversary release or whatever it may be. I'm sure it's coming. We'll see. (laughs) I know nothing, so it's not a we'll see. (laughs) We'll see. I mean it. Um, I would love to remix one or two things. Because, you know, for example, one one of the great losses, I think, of Emancipation was uh, she gave her angels, which ended up on Crystal Ball, and the reason it ended up on there is because it was on the Muppet Show, so it should be released. 
but that was like the center point of the second disc until the Holy River took over. Um, and that would have been a huge, if properly done, that would be a huge uh, Bohemian Rhapsody size song, sonically and in terms of, of content. And I would certainly would love to remix or have somebody remix Chaos in Disorder. Because that would that that thing is just huge, and right now it's like you say, it's kind of, it's kind of like Led Zeppelin doing a club gig. Right, it's fantastic, it? but yeah, it's like yeah, when when are you gonna do it for real exactly? Right. Or yeah, I love that record too. All right, so here's a few questions. If there's one big takeaway that you had working there, um, that you is there one big takeaway that you had working at Paisley Park that you still apply? to your work now specifically maybe there's a, a technique or some type of recording approach uh anything that you can think of that you learned on hand there and there's probably a lot of things but there's probably like one specific thing where it's like uh yeah this is one one uh approach or tactic that is still my a good go-to for me um my general philosophy in uh the way I conduct myself in sessions, that certainly is still there. You know, I I don't think there's any technique or technology that is worth people losing their creative drive over, meaning I'm there to serve the artist, not the other way around. So this whole approach is like, oh wait, I don't have let's let's put the mic up another sixteenth of an inch uh and do this and blah blah blah. It doesn't work for me. When people show up in my sessions, I'm ready to roll. Um, and I I communicate with them and I try to understand what they want and what makes them tick and what makes them happy and what makes the thing flow. Mm -hmm. And that is important to me. I, you know, to be prepared, that's the experience part. I know the options and especially if I've worked with them before, but I'm ready to capture lightning. Because that's my job. It's not the bottle that it's about. It's about the lightning in the bottle. And I'm not doing the lightning. That's the creative people. So I need to be ready to catch that lightning. Because once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. So that's what I take away from that. That's really, don't be in the way. And I think that's the reason why people want to work with me. I mean, uh, you know, the Prince thing is super special. Because even people like Peter Gabriel ask me for Prince stories. Where I'm like, hmm. That just seems to be a thing even among famous people. Um yeah, well, um, I would love to have Peter Gabriel on the show. Yeah. It's just, I mean, he is just one of my all-time favorite artists. I mean, there's like a, a top 10 list, and he's yeah. definitely in there. He's just one of these guys. Who's just, I'm, I'm with you. I sent resumes while I was working for Prince to Real World, not because I hated Paisley so much, but because I thought that was probably the best place for an engineer to learn whatever, because he's just so diverse. So, yeah, so yeah. ahead of his time. Yeah. He was just right. always, always pushing the boundaries. He was just like, let's see what we can do now. And, and he was very, very out front about it. It was like, I'm not sure if this is going to work or not, but here it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, what it, that, so, but to, to finish answering your question, that is really the big thing I took away because um, I've had another learning experience as well after I came back to Europe and, you know, people would hire me to do projects for them. And then I'd approach them technically um, and sonically like a Prince thing because I figured, okay, or I knew that they hired me because I'm the Prince guy. And that never worked. All of a sudden, you know, I had these like, eh, and no callbacks. Yeah. Um, because and then I realized, ah, they don't want to sound like Prince. They just like the idea of it. Even huge Prince fans, you know, I would do a mix for and it would sound like something of Emancipation. But what they really wanted was Jamiroquai. They were just huge Prince fans at the same time. I'm like, ah, I get it. So once I figured that out, my life got much better here. But for a while there, I was really confused what was going on. Um, so my point being is, it's not about, the whole Prince thing is not about a specific technique. You know, every once in a while, I, people ask me, so how did you do the vocal sound? And then I'd rattle off the three pieces of gear that I used. Or, you know, what's special about him is that uh, that clean funky guitar sound so i put up that you know i make that sound and then they play it 
and they're not impressed. Why? Because they're not prince. Well, and they also had, you know, and you had mentioned that'll be on my gravestone. He captured prince pretty well. Uh, <laughs> sonic princeness, not at all. I I captured what he brought to the table, and I wasn't in his way. And I, I, you know, and that I keep trying to do. Well, you had mentioned that you know people didn't want to sound like Prince, but you know you were also a part of that of people pulling together that uh, loop package, but the sample package that uh, I guess never saw the light of day either. But yeah, there is I, a gun. Yes, I actually heard uh, some pieces from that package. Um, first off, it was very high priced, obviously, but you know it wasn't meant for regular consumers. It was, but some of the stuff was very, very definitively Prince. It was like, you know, you can't do that, that beginning guitar riff of kiss and then have you not think of Prince. It's just, so I, I, I got it, but then at the same time, I didn't get it. <laughs> like, I didn't really understand what the, what the purpose of, of, of doing that was, but, and especially as you said, you know, there was people that just, they liked Prince and they loved the sound, but, they didn't necessarily want to sound like him. So I don't know. Do you think that if that loop package actually ever got out, that it would be, would it just be a scenario just somebody just had to have it? <laughs> just, ha I have to have it as a collector, not as I'm actually going to use it. Uh, accessible yeah. at all. That was one of those really interesting things because I was, <laughs> I was totally ignored for this whole thing because I was just the guy saying, this is, Watch out, dude. Not in those words, I might add. Watch right. out because they're going to eat you alive. Because, you know, I think what attracted it to him was that he could uh, make a lot of money. You know, I mean, you, 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 the sample discs at the time were very expensive. And you'd have like a double disc and you'd pay a three-digit dollar amount um, for one disc. So I figure... What he thought is like, oh, okay, I'm going to sell as much of that as I sell of my other stuff for 10 times the price. Um, and then the idea was to do the seven CD set. And I said, do you realize that every one of those CDs has about a thousand samples on it, at least? Meaning 7,000 samples you want to give away. You know how much work that is? And you have to do it right because it's for, you know, it's not for the general listening public. They're not going to listen to <laughs> that's not what they're going to listen to. It's for actually professionals. They have very specific ideas what that needs to be to be worth that price. It's not just something you throw together. And then he wanted to put like, I don't know, a minute and a half on each disc just so he could stick to that seven minute thing bad stuff and then he had like all the um the the live crew edit samples you know we'd have like a mobile little i think i don't know if it was pro tools whatever they'd sit around on laptops and just cut off the beginnings and the ends and we you know sit put up tapes and then get little snippets out and the interesting stuff he didn't want to give away you know like morris hayes and i we <laughs> we of course actively got the things we wanted to have on a sample disc so we could use it without him getting mad. You know, I remember me specifically wanting to get uh, the groove from Release It. Right. And then that, that whatever it is, sound, that harp sound on Thieves in the Temple tonight. The Thieves in the Temple tonight. That sound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, him and I would just make a little pack that we just get all that stuff that we really wanted to have. But then that was too, too distinct for him. So thank God he that that didn't happen because a he would have been eaten alive. Um, and the thing would have happened that he hated the most, which was that people could use his music without him. Oh yeah, final decision. Which that would really make sense. Yeah, which is another thing reason I think the studio never opened again because they were um after my time very very um intense uh, attempts to open it again and during my time as well and i said in my during my times look we need staff if you want that type of money you want and you can't you know you can't tell snoop doggy dog not to say fuck on his record if he records at your place he'll right. just record what he it's like somebody it's like a tenant somebody you know you don't tell them what to wear in their own apartment you just take the rent 
And that's exactly, you know, so that never happened again. And with sample discs, that would have been even worse, meaning, you know, some yeah. some potty mouth Nazi <laughs> Russian rapper could have used meow and all that stuff and and <laughs> and done their stuff and he couldn't have done anything about it. So that would have been uh, the worst possible thing. Yeah. So nobody's nobody has a a finished copy of that loop package. That's never the light of day. Nothing ever left the place. You know, I should point that out to people. Um, I once made the mistake after I left, you know, people thought for some reason, because I worked for Prince, I would be interested in bootlegs. So a Prince loving friend of mine once gave me a CD with like, I don't know, a gazillion MP3s of all the, the outtakes that, that um, not my stuff, mind you, but 80s outtakes that people uh, love so much. Mm -hmm. And I had no use for it. So I gave it to somebody else and they figured I'm the guy who copped it. And that's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. And I can tell you nothing, nothing ever left the place without Prince wanting it to. The ultimate sign of trust was that I took the tapes of like, for example, stuff like uh, Rave and went mastering on my own. So I would be in cabs mm. in New York. Where to? Electric Lady with, with tapes and stuff like that. Um, but nonetheless, I would never, ever do that. So nobody got a copy of anything. I don't know how oh, that was later when it got more digital, but I had nothing. The only thing I ever did, and I've admitted to this before, so I can do it now, now that's released. I loved Wonderful Ass so much. The song, that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I was really <laughs> unhappy that um, that didn't make it onto Crystal Ball. And then it got it was being considered again for a very short-lived uh, revolution outtake record in 1999 that uh, we briefly worked on. Same same setup as, as Crystal Ball, go into the vault, get all these tapes, transfer, see what we're going to do. That sweating, when he was gone for a while, I actually made myself a copy of Wonderful Ass onto a cassette. I didn't even write Wonderful Ass on it. I just wrote question marks so at my house I would know what it would be. So I could listen to it from time to time because I thought that was so cool. Yeah. That's the only thing I ever took with me and nobody ever heard it other than myself. Well, it's out there now. It was, it's actually, yeah, I know. that's why I'm admitting to it because, you know, <laughs> deal. but like I would, uh, I, you know, I would never bootleg. I would never do that. Nothing ever got out and certainly not that sample stuff. What was the thing, you know, out of those thousand samples, um, the diggy diggy digs and wahs and stuff that's print stuff but like if you take us uh, that you know those very princey snare sounds for example um or from the 80s those aren't really that special they're just us a, a, you know a lindrum um, machine meaning you could get those anyways on lindrum machine sample packs right so we ran out of samples to do this we had we had like i don't know couple of hundred together but not enough to even fill one disc let alone seven yeah uh, what was the biggest screw up that you ever had working with prince like something screw up? yeah uh everyone has them they're, they're typically well, stories that so people one should, I should admit to openly <laughs> <laughs> uh there's one where i used the wrong tape speed where the tape machine wasn't set up properly for that welcome to the dawn version that's on the truth but i fixed that in mastering so that's all right um and one tape which is one of the command remixes uh, i don't know if that's my fault i think but it's still under my watch so it's a screw up <laughs> the digital tape we used is you know really flimsy kind of like old vhs tapes it's not solid like proper analog tape All right and something happened during rewind that it got stretched and all of a sudden you know at some point it went from like being the the half inch that was really like like a rubber band and it stayed that way so there's about two seconds of one of the com command remixes that it won't be able to reproduce uh, yeah it's, it's... <laughs> did he know about it or did you uh, plenty, plenty of no he didn't this was after we mixed it and stuff. So, but there's nothing, I, I don't think it's anything I could do about it. The tape machine just freaked out. Um, 
and I'm sure I there's nothing that I haven't I'll think about it if I think of anything I write take I send you a mail yeah, you'll let me know but there, right. there, you know we all have that I met of Alan course once who was who did you know in a, in a tape op it was called so tape handling duties on Abbey Road by the Beatles. And the thing he remembers, one of the things he remembers is where he mispunched, meaning what you can do on a tape machine is you record and then you go, you hear what's already recorded and then you go into record and then you play the new stuff and then you need to get out of record to keep what's behind it. So in tape land, that was, you know, kind of mm -hmm. at first because if you get in too early, you erase for good what was there before. If you get out too late, you race for good was afterwards. So there's one spot on Abbey Road where Alan Parsons had told me, well, I did a mispunch. And then when I listen to that, I hear it because I know it, but I would have never noticed. Wow. Awesome. So that type of stuff. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Last question. Are there songs that stick in your memory working for Prince that never saw the light of day? And uh, you think, man. I wish that they would release that song because, you know, it's a great track or because it, whether you worked on it or, or not, or maybe it's a song that you kind of stumbled upon in the vault that still has not seen the light of day. Is there something you can think of? You're like, man, that song, that's like a fantastic song. I'm really disappointed. That's never seen. I know you mentioned Splash because I don't think Splash has been released yet. Uh, that's my favorite uh, Prince time as a fan, you know, so that eh. I'm a huge parade fan and sign of the time. So those are my two where I think it's the perfect mixture between wanting to please in a pop way and being freaky and having an attitude and being funky all at the same time. So it's just yeah. stuff. Um, no, I think most of it has been released. Splash as being one of them that I like. And, you know, I have to realize that um, it, during my time, he had the freedom to release whatever, whenever. So he was just out of the Warner thing, and he did. So... Um, a lot of the things that I could mention now have actually been released on those um, mm -hmm. uh, the Slaughterhouse and the Chocolate Invasion compilations that were um, MPG Music Club. You can stream them, and they were MPG Music Club things. Yeah, so those are those are quite awesome. Those songs on there. There's one or two. You know, rave is a r rave is pulled together from quite a few things from ninety eight through ninety nine, and there was a period in in ninety eight, early ninety nine, where stuff like "So Far So Pleased" were made and "Beautiful Strange." Um, so I guess not unlike uh, "Chaos and Disorder," you know, very guitar heavy, um, bit quirky songs. Um, and there's a cover of still the one that I always really liked by Shania Twain, which he kind of approached kind of like, uh, Creed I don't know that I've heard that. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's him and Marva King singing together and he's doing the, <laughs> that is on the, the creep by Radiohead, you know, that, that type of mm -hmm. road, he would be <laughs> still the one is, 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 that was really cool. <laughs> oh, that's, um, I remember that. And then there's one song that I keep mentioning that's from the very first recording session that I did with him on that very first day that I was his guy. Uh, and I've said it before in public, so I can say it again. It's called The Divine. And it's kind of like, it's one of his preaching songs somewhere between The Cross and uh, We March. You know, some something along those lines. That would be fun just for completion's sake to hear that again one of these days. Yeah, I think I I think I I may have a, a copy of it, but I know you want me to wait until it gets released before you hear it. So, actually, I would. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I might try to get it for you. Well, I cannot thank you enough for spending this uh, inordinate amount of time with me. I appreciate this so much. I know it was kind of uh, a little bit last minute, but it was good to be able to get into your head and and kind of uh, understand some of the process and. If people wanted to find out more about you or you got bands out there that really want you to put your your masterwork onto their recordings, how can they get in touch with you? I have a website in dire needs of update <laughs> called www.buffwork. That's B-U-F-F-W-E-R-K.com. 
And that Buffwork thing is also my Instagram handle. So that's the best way to get a hold of me. On the on the website, there's an email address and you can find me. Well, I greatly appreciate your time once again, sir. And uh, it's going to be awesome. We will get this posted ASAP because I want people to hear your stories. They're absolutely fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Chris. And you have a fabulous day. You first. <laughs>